have a guest in the studio at Morning Lead today at T-Town Radio at T-TownRadio.com, the sound from Germantown, who is not walking on by. I think it's important that over the course of the day that we can show that this is a unified state issue. Me and my friends, the students understand how they've been robbed and like abused over the course of the year. Like I mean, I'm a teacher and parent driven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if, if you talk about the organizing models, there are multiple models. Um, to be part of the decision, we know there needs to be an assessment, but an assessment that is unfair to English as a second language and some of the other students that have IEPs or it's should. It's morphed into something that's cancerous right now. It's eating up the good parts of what education is supposed to be. And parents need to step into the ring and stay. I will not allow my children to be tested because it does not further their education. It will not help them get to the next level. And it's emotional for me because I cannot figure out a way for them to get the education that they deserve without me having to pay for it because I, I believe in public education. I don't understand why the public education now will not do that for my kids. Um, parents need to stay and fight. to make a point and the point is about the state of education where it is now in this country and well <laughs> let's have another metaphor the fork in the road that is lays directly ahead of us and which do we take sure we've been looking at uh, no child left behind race to the top uh, they'll switch the names around but they're the same 1.2 trillion dollars hated allocated to focus on standardized testing, allocated to force our schools to compete, allocated to force our poorer schools uh, to close so that they're not uh, reaching their adequate test scores. Mm. And it, it's, been, it's been a dismal failure. There are three main... So, can teachers actually get in trouble for talking about this? Because I think that this is what I wasn't really clear on. There are sort of two scenarios, and some of it depends on the school environment. It's legal to opt out. The school districts are all supposed to send home that paper where hidden in plain view is the information about opting out. Um, but obviously that isn't easy. Oh, they're supposed to send home information? Yeah, it's a parent fact sheet, FAQ. And is that on, just Philadelphia? No, every, the school, the, the Pennsylvania Department of Education has a, a PSSA and a Keystone parent FAQ sheet. And it has all various information. And one of the sections says, may parents see the assessment? And then it says, yes, you may request to see the assessment. And if after you've seen the assessment, you have a religious objection, you can opt out. But it's, it, if you didn't read the whole thing and know how to interpret it, it wouldn't right. jump right out at you. Right. So we had created in Philadelphia, which was widely used, sort of a, an easy form. Like, I'm exercising my right under this law, and all you had to do was fill in the principal's name, your name, the kid's name, the grade, the school, sign it, and it was done. But it's just hard for people to wrap their minds around how to do that, like, to right. translate it from this little paragraph. So, like, what does that mean? Who do I send it to? Da -da -da. So this was a much more straightforward process, and from what I understand, in many respects, the district actually appreciated having a very concrete letter on file that went through the process. Like, having the letter was fine. Um, and there was nothing on this letter that we created that had anything that would indicate it was from a school or a school district. The only contact information was the opt-out Philly Gmail account. That was, you know, it, it was just a information, but it, it didn't, you know, it wasn't a school district letter or anything. Um, so, in some schools, the information was shared and the circumstances were such that it was 
was fine once the parents had the information. In other schools, principals actually called students into their office and said, where did you get that letter? So where one there teacher had, got suspended. One teacher got suspended, well, four days without pay. Now she's since gotten a job at a different school. I started like a, our own school district on mm -hmm. that page, and I shared that there. And oh. like a lot of people were like, they, the teachers were going on them liking it. And yeah, wow. Well, there's so many people who I, everybody who I talked to about it was on the fence, and they just kind of were nervous like, and weren't oh, sure, and didn't know yeah. what to do. And, mm -hmm. Is it going to hurt my school? Are people going to look right. at me funny? There's no local control at, at all. And the focus, research tells us, the more we focus on high stakes testing, the higher our dropout rates, the higher our behavioral problems, suspensions, expulsions, and the higher our dropout rates. Guess what? <laughs> all three of those things have come true. 19 states have exit high school exit, exit exams. The, since they've had them, their dropout rates have increased. Warning, Pennsylvania. Warning, warning, warning. The Keystone Test. This group of students, I talked to a father from Philadelphia yesterday about his son, Jake. Jake is a young high school student who was taking the Keystone, and he was set to take the math test, and Jake was ready to take the math, went to school. He's one of those kids that studied and prepared. I never studied and prepared for these things. Jake did, and when he got to school, the supposed calculators that were supposed to come did not come, so the school switched around and gave him the biology test. Jake freaks out. And not only that, Jake has been told that if he doesn't pass all the Keystone tests, he cannot graduate high school. This kid's life, like many of our Pennsylvania high schoolers now, are becoming a life of misery. Um, what you talked about control. The class of 2017, which is the current sophomores and any students following behind, they will need to pass at least three Keystone exams, English, Algebra, and Biology, in order to get any high school diploma. So you wow. might... Well, you are walking, obviously, to make a point. And the point is about the state of education, where it is now in this country, and, well, <laughs> let's have another metaphor. The fork in the road that is lays directly ahead of us, and which do we take? Sure, we've been looking at... Uh, no Child Left Behind, Race to the Top, uh, they'll switch the names around, but they're the same. $1.2 trillion allocated, allocated to focus on standardized testing, allocated to force our schools to compete, allocated to force our poorest schools uh, to close so that they're not uh, reaching their adequate test scores. Mm. And it, it's been it's been a dismal failure. The state-level passing rates on the Keystones are about 50 percent. One thing we're trying to do is to say to the courts, okay, look, um, state itself said this is how much it costs to reach these this proficiency. State itself is not providing that to schools, so state should be liable under our under our state constitution to funding that. Yeah. Um, and it's not just a, a, an issue in, in urban school districts; it's throughout. It's statewide. Um, in particularly, it's very much impacting students whose first language is not English, students with IP, students with anxiety disorder, like anyone who does not fit sort of the very standard high achieving student mold is getting pulled into this net. Um, if, you're, if you join the opt-out group, I can send you a link. 12th grade in order to graduate. Yeah. I know my daughter is almost 24 and she also went through that. Um, where she didn't take it because she was homeschooled, and then they called it, and she needed it to graduate. Yeah. So it became a law, not by the school district, but by the state, that these children need, to, and especially if they're going to graduate for 2017, they really put a strict on it. Yeah. So um, they need to take at least three keystones mm -hmm. out of their um, high school years in order to graduate. However. Whether my son takes one or not, since he has an IEP, he would graduate anyway because it's a law. Okay. So, we, um, as a parent, I just try to stay up on the school district. Um, I got put out of 440 North Park Street because they don't want to hear about the kid with the disability. They didn't want to help the kid with the disability. No, no, no. Every school my children go to, 
I didn't place them. School district placed them. It just seemed like as soon as my name come up on something, they already excluded because they know that that's the only way to hurt my feelings is to mess with my kids. But I keep fighting. I go up there every day. However, um, they had to lift the detainer based on the letter they, the nice little letter that they wrote that I gave the district attorney. State that I don't threaten nobody. I don't make noise. Mm -hmm. um, I asked for the person, but they were intimidated because when I'm told when the person is not there, I would sit outside of the office and sit there all day and return the very next day and ask for the same person and do it until they agree to sit and talk to me. So they found that intimidating. So you're making a six figure. You are a parent support of Board of Education. Yeah. But you don't have time to talk to a parent who have all these major concerns over the child that has the disability in the wrong school that you placed them in. Mm -hmm. So that was before I decided to just keep calling these hearings to take them and make them have no other choice. I was just trying to settle it. But I see that didn't work. Yeah. Right. So um, I get a lot of support from like my... He's not even my councilman. I call him my dad, Curtis Jones Jr. If I don't know something, I go ask home. I still have Franca Palumbo. She's the best attorney in the world that takes the school district to court for parents that don't know what they're doing. Um, anyone can be an advocate for their child. You just got to learn how to run with them, speak up for them. Always defend your child with the disability unless they're out there doing wrong. Never sugarcoat their life and always just be mindful that they're never really going to deal with society as much as we want them to. And that's why they have all these little different things that you can put your children in where they get extra learning support. But a lot of parents don't have this money. Right. And that's where the comp ed comes in. So unless you're willing to go and pursue with the school district to make them pay for these things then you won't know nothing about it and that, is that on their website any of that the, the mm. cop ad or the the mm. low education fund nope so what people got to google it how do you it's not these tests are not built i mean they're built to sort kids into piles and it's very inhumane yeah um so well, i learned from a parent yesterday with an iep that um, because they have an IEP, they cannot fail that student. And um, regardless of what that test is, they still should be able to graduate on time with their graduating class. That's the law of the um, IEP, but I'll, I'll make sure. Only if it's written in their IEP and they have to reach a certain threshold. There's 10% of waivers. The superintendent can offer 10% of a year of waivers. Oh, and there's, really? no, there's no way of saying, like, who gets them. The like superintendent can offer a waiver? 10 to 10%. Of the, okay. But in Philadelphia, 10% would never meet the Because my son... Is that 10% for IEPs or 10% for 10 everybody? It's not all designated across. who has Can the 10%. Can you send me information on that to my... That in itself, there's a problem. How, yeah. how are those 10% somewhere? Being allocated. Yeah. My friend's son is deaf, and he's... He, um, you know, he's got some language problems. He's a bright kid. Like, mm -hmm. his IQ is like 120. Like, bright mm -hmm. kid. But the language isn't there because he has the, um, what's that thing, the CP, the, um, the implant. Cochlear. Yes, exactly. Um, but he didn't get that till he was six, so a lot of his language development didn't happen. Why? He, you know, missed that window. Right. Um, so he's really struggling, and she doesn't, you know, and he's 2017. Right. So he sees Do you think, that, like... But I, mean, I didn't know anything about getting a waiver. She's terrified that he's not going to pass and he's but, not going to get his diploma. Yeah. And I, but, but nobody knows. Like, until 27, like, that's the sacrificial class. Right. And nobody knows. There's all these outstanding questions that nobody knows. Nobody knows. But I will have to tell her about the yeah. waiver. Well, because in our district, I think, we, like, I know all the PSSAs, we're in the 90% as far as being proficient or advanced. Mm -hmm. So what I was going to say before, the issue that we're having because we are a very high-performing district, but because of the new SKP score, we're not, not going to grow, are you? We're not growing. <laughs> Sorry. There's nowhere to go. There's, we're not growing. <laughs> and it's for our middle school next year, they are cutting foreign language, they're cut, they are reducing the amount of time from what? music and art. So we have, so we've cut foreign language all through elementary school. 
And the way it's been is that our middle school in sixth grade, you, it's, you get exposed to three world languages. You do a third of the year in Spanish, a third in French, a third in German. And then when you get to seventh grade, you pick what language you want to do. They're eliminating sixth grade foreign language. They're replacing it with a period, in addition to the math and the English, it's going to be three days math and three days English, going back and forth to better prepare our students to for the PSSAs. Horrible. Turning education into an industrial enterprise. Exactly. For the profit of the people who are managing content. So it's right. not just, they're profiting off the testing, but they're also profiting on designing the content, which is really limiting what kids have access to the amount of information. Right, because exactly. the companies are deciding what you get to learn about, because that's what's tested. Exactly. The, the problem is, as the opt-out movement grows, and this is this is the plan for these companies, is that they want every they want to push tw everything towards online learning, so that everything is more and more online, less and less like group projects, Direct creator projects. projects, working with with teachers, um, interdisciplinary learning. You just work through your modules; it's all personalized, but that just means you're just working by yourself, right, at your own pace on this the screen, content, right? exactly. So. What the companies that are doing that, they recognize the, the potential power of the opt-out movement. What their move is to say, okay, let's not have one big test. What we'll do instead is, because that's high stakes, and yes, okay, finally we acknowledge that maybe that's a problem to have one single high stakes test in one year, because you're right, maybe you shouldn't be judged on your work for three or four days out of the whole year. But that's limited. So let me tell you what we'll do. We'll have you plug along on these computer programs all year long, and we'll just monitor you all the time. And that's what we'll use to assess you. Right. Because it'll be really broad, because it'll be every day. And we'll just data mine you from the first day you walk in in September until you leave in June. And it's it's not a quality education. It's very much a corporate managed right. computer exactly. online. So, right, and those like, people need to go. They like, we really need to head them out of the picture of education and have it more directed towards the demographic of the communities so that education is partnering with the communities and not trying to manage the communities to be what they want them to be. Like I don't know how corporate ever got so deep involved. Because in the housing market died and they couldn't make anything out of nothing. They couldn't make money out of nothing anymore after the housing bubble burst. And so education was the next thing and they moved on to making money off of so, education. So local control of the curriculum, right? Yes. Local, I, what I think would be great would be if there were multiple tests and the local school district can select what year-end assessments that, you know, what standardized year-end assessment that they want to administer. And that way, the control this, would be at the local level. But I like project-based learning for some, too. I think that should be an option also because everybody doesn't learn from textbooks and that one-on-one -on -one instruction. But if you give them a project... Sure. They're learning along lines as they're building their project, right? And that's a better way to assess them by the completion of their projects than to give them a test that stresses people out. Like me and Tess is like I'm, I could study all night long, and when I get to that test, my mind will go blank just because that test is in front of me. And then after I calm myself down, <laughs> I'm able to take the test, but I've lost about 20, 30 minutes of the testing period. So well, there's there's the portfolio which right. is the, the approach that, you know, probably most private schools use. Mm -hmm. is that you, you, you show that you've mastered standards by your body of work over time and mm -hmm. maybe a special, like, end-of-the-year project that, that synthesizes all of the things that you're supposed to do and then you have to sort of present it to the community and the school and outside people and if it's not up to snuff, you go back and rework it until it's good enough. But it's not, okay, it's not like it's just... just you know, once it's done, I'm sorry, you're, you're a failure, and you'll never, you know, move forward. But the reality is, is that I don't think nobody wants to pay for that. Nobody wants to pay for teachers or staff or materials or art supplies or time or community. They want to keep it a very tightly managed industrial process, really. That they care, and and I think it really it it downplays the fact that people are individuals and have individual talents and we don't all have to do the same things well. Right. <laughs> no. The yes. problem is, is, like she said, the industrialization of it, you know, becomes like the data mining that they can use that follows a kid for the rest of their life. Right. You know, I wouldn't want my grades from high school to follow me for the rest of my life. I was a lot better college student than a high school student. <laughs>
Yeah. And why should Well, that? like, even they, they say some kids come in into kindergarten, oh, I'm sorry, you're already three years behind. It's kindergarten. Right. The, breadth, the full breadth of testing. And I think because Westchester is going to be a very high-performing district, right. and they're not going to look good on the SVP. That's, the, that's our problem. So, okay, so here's what they said when they were sending out the email about the changes that they're making at the middle school. For Human Valley School District, a strong student achievement, blah, 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 blah wonderful. This year, approximately 90% of our students were proficient or advanced on the PSSAs and keystones. While student achievement is consistently strong district-wide, additional data have indicated that our proficient and advanced middle-level students are not growing as expected. <laughs> like, you're advanced, but you're not getting better fast enough! <laughs> right, absolutely so student growth is measured through the <laughs> Pennsylvania Value-Added Assessment <laughs> System, blah, blah, blah. This student, is done by people who are not educators. That's the problem. Student growth in reading is below, like, I think we're like 94% proficient, but we didn't grow enough. They said, so increased instructional time, course subjects, we believe will strengthen the experiences, blah, 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 blah. And so, sell yeah. more test prep programs, so, probably. Yeah, so they're, and they, like, right now we yeah. have a ninth period, like, the last period of the day is where they can, like, that's when you have band orders for a course, or it's you like... You need to say this stuff. We need to, like, have, I mean, I know, you know I but, I mean, like, we need this platform. Yes. Well, and they're actually and we can use this seven for that. I mean, yeah, that's when it changes. Like, do we have some platform? I think, I think we're eliminating the four. Keystone exam as a graduation Keystone requirement. requirement. For, right. And I mean, not to be exclusive of the larger region, but for Philadelphia, the most, it's a train wreck about having, it, like, no, it, it's I mean, it's shocking And no one me. knows that this is coming. It is shocking to me. When I read that, I was, because I yeah. saw those posts, I was like, how? How can you tell an entire school that they don't graduate from high school because, like, it's absurd. Well, everyone says, oh, it will just go away. I'm like, I don't really see this going away with, like, all of a sudden nobody talks about it and it's a big secret and nobody knows we're all failing and then one day, poof, it just doesn't, and then it's done and it doesn't happen. Like, I don't see how that's going to Everybody realistic. wants somebody else to take care of it. So, I right. think the most pressing, timely message I think for us as a city is around the Keystone exams. Mm -hmm. And then rippling back into this testing also is impacting younger and younger students and the PSSAs. Oh, right. and I'm we do to help you uh, get more funding and make Philadelphia... Uh, uh, and different audiences advocating on, on bringing more resources to kids. And ensuring that communities continue to advocate heavily one, and not just more funding, but equitable funding. Yes. Because one of, you know, I, I will share with you, and, I, and hopefully you know this and you see this, the governor has been amazingly aggressive about trying to get more funding for education. Even his historic, you know, allegiances, you know, being a businessman, you know, having done well for himself, the community that, that he's always been engaged with most of his, most of his career, that doesn't necessarily always see things the way he's seeing things, and he is is, is bucking his, his own past systems, you know, of support, and he's challenging them. I mean, he's telling wealthier communities, you have to invest for the betterment of the state and communities that don't have the same means you have. He's telling, you know, wealthier school districts that we have to create an equitable system of distribution of funds so that all school districts are given the resources that they need to meet the standards that you've set. I mean, you know, when we talk about education standards, education standards are based on, are, are established based on middle class values, so to speak. So when you have, you know, when you make really good money, you have all these resources at home, then, you know, when we take a look at wealth as a better indicator of, you know, as you said, standardized, you know, test scores, because they're based on those types of, uh, you know, uh, on those on those types of supports. So the the governor has put a budget in in place, is proposing a budget. We're supporting, advocating, pushing for a budget that brings resources to our neediest students. The numbers the numbers in the legislature don't always support that movement. And what ends up happening is there aren't there isn't enough pressure on the legislature to make decisions that are in the best interest of the Commonwealth and not just their local small constituency base. 
And it's not just the wealthy versus poor district, which is interesting, and I'll share it with you, because it's, we're not only fighting this battle with wealthy, wealthy districts, we're fighting this battle even with poor rural districts, because the response has been, hey, we've always done more with less, so we're okay with it. And my response has been, but why? Why, why should we have to tell children that you don't have access to you know, the, the resources that they deserve you know, and they need to be successful? So, so it really is continuing to, to advocate the thorn, I mean, the thorn on our side to keep us true to our mission, but to continue to, to be strong advocates you know, for funding, but most importantly, for equitable funding. And, and I would never ask for you to do anything specific, although opportunities will arise for, you know, for the department, but you know, I think, one, for us, two, you know, for the governor to realize he's taking on, he's taking on an incredible mission. And if for nothing else, you know, he needs to know that there are, you know, millions, you know, of, of residents and stakeholders that are behind him pushing his agenda. Because I don't, you know, I fear what will happen if he has to carry this load on his own and, and what it means for the future of our children. So continue advocating. All right, we're going to leave it there. Find different, different issues and concerns. I'm finding, I'm so, finding many, so many different mentalities different mentality today. Mentality. It seems hard. It seems, hard. hard. It seems, it seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard, hard is the concrete that we walk on. Everything, everything else, else is a challenge. Is a challenge. challenge. Um, um, so, so, I'm ready, for, I'm this ready for this challenge, and I was built, I was for, this. built for this. I think that, I think we, that all we all have a purpose in life, in life. and mine is going to take on a task that most of that most are back away from, back away from. from. Impossible, that impossible, that people say it's impossible, I see possibilities, I don't see anything, I don't see anything as being impossible. Mentality, mentality, there are different, there are different mentalities, mentalities, but just like just there's like different, there's different ways to teach people how to read, there's, there's different, different, ways, different ways, ways to communicate people. people. There's different ways, there's different ways to communicate people, people and their different, different mentalities. So I do, so I do see hope. I see hope, and that's all coming together and understanding each other and learning to respect.